Hello and welcome to Shop Talk Live, the changing shape of UK and Irish food retailing. Today we're joined by Laurence Engbers, CEO of Friardo, Scott and Anne, founder of Blue and Anta, Noel Keeley, CEO at Musgrave, and Gavin Rothwell, founder of Food Futures Insights. Over to you, Dan. Well, welcome to the 17 countries uh, watching Shop Talk Live today. Uh, we're going to be looking at the changing shape of UK and Irish food retailing. And today uh, we're going to start off uh, by focusing on food to go. In terms of our channel, it's, uh, it's a category, it's, a, it's an area of the business that we've been doing very well in over the last decade. There are significant challenges to that in terms of doing well. Uh, for retailers developing, executing, perfecting food service uh, from preparation to food pre uh, preservation in counters um, is particularly tough um, from an execution point of view, particularly obviously for hot food to go. And uh, to begin the programme, we're going to be talking to Friardo, who have a long history uh, in this area in terms of manufacturing uh, high quality technology for, for helping retailers with, with this. And if I could welcome Lawrence Engbers, um, who's the CEO, to um, to give us his thoughts on on what's happening from Friado's perspective, and also to hear about some of the work um, in his presentation that uh, he's done with uh, with Morrison's, and many of you hopefully will have watched the the video we did uh, just a few weeks ago um, in Manchester, looking at that fabulous um, it really is fabulous new Morrison's Market Kitchen store. Uh, Lawrence, um, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thank you for a very nice introduction. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, introducing hot food, especially into small store formats. Um, so, um, yeah, if Nick can start the presentation. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, uh, what I'm going to talk about is the why, the how and the what of introducing uh, hot food in general, but especially into small store formats. Let's, let's start with the why. Why should you invest into hot food into uh, those smaller formats? Um, if we take a look at, at the market and we divide the food market in the food at home and the food away uh, from home market, you can see that nowadays it's almost a 50-50 deviation between uh, the both uh, markets. Um, actually, nowadays the stomach share between the two markets is practically the same. Um, that was very different about 40 years ago. Uh, there was a deviation about uh, 25, 75%. Um, and the question is um, not so much, you know, why did that uh, develop? But the question is who did seize the most of that market? Well, if you take a look at um, the traditional restaurants and the QSR restaurants, they have by far the biggest market share. What's also remarkable if you drill down into institutionals, into grocery, into C stores, is that the last 20 years, there was um, more or less the same market share in between the different formats that offer food away from home. Now, the question is, is that going to stay the same or can you expect that to change? If we would drill down on the different generation, you see a totally different uh, picture. Um, uh, we, we broken down uh, th that same share of stomach between Generation Z, Millennials and uh, other generations. And other generations are like, like me, but also the most of you who are sitting there uh, watching this, uh, this uh, episode, is that um, Generation Z is really uh, uh, behaving differently from uh, previous generations. You can see that the biggest growth is caused by Generation Z if you talk about uh, food out of home, about QSRs. But also, if you take a look about grocery shopping or convenience shopping, is that Generation Z finds their way to sea stores, to petrol stations, much more than any generations uh, before that. Actually, it's almost the same. There is as much shopping done in the smaller store fam formats as there is in the bigger formats. Now, what's motivation is there for a generation set to start shopping in a different manner? Well, by far, but that's for all generations. If, if you just go one slide uh, back, uh, Nick, uh, by far for all generations, that's uh, a convenient location, but that's more important to generation Z than to any other generation. 
Um, uh, less important is uh, uh, positive experience or the quality of the product. But what's, what's a very important factor of visiting a certain location is they are more driven by impulse. One of the reasons why they're more driven by impulse is that their behavior is different from prior generations. They cook less at home, they eat more outside of home. Um, many of them uh, in, in nowadays in, in, in London downtown, Amsterdam, Shanghai, they just don't have the kitchens anymore uh, to work from. Uh, they're much more interested in the experience of going somewhere, uh, gaming, sports, than they are, you know, sitting at home and share a meal with your family. So if you understand that type of behavior of younger generations, and if you link that into, you know, what's creating the biggest, most biggest impulse in presenting food, then if you go to the next slide, um, you'll find out that hot food makes a difference. I mean, the moment when Subway created um, um, a, 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 a melted cheese um, on, their, uh, 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 on their product, their, their sales went up. And the same goes like, uh, I mean, if nobody goes for McDonald's for their salads, they'll go there for the hot food. So hot food is a real activator. And it digs into a complete different uh, consumer fulfillment than there is with refrigerated food. It's providing comfort. It's providing uh, a, a more satisfaction, hot taste better, warm me up, et cetera, et cetera. And if you understand that, and, and that's predicted by IGD, that the food to go market will grow by more than 25% over the next 25 years, then there is a huge opportunity for especially the smaller stores to dig in to uh, provide this growing food to go uh, 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 to this growing food to go market. Um, so, uh, if we all understand, you know, the reason why hot food is very important into new, your new store and to store formats, then we go into from the why we go to the how. Eh? How are you gonna uh, create a successful hot food program into your store operation? Of course, uh, choosing the right product is essential. Eh? You have to work towards uh, demographics uh, from the area where you sell from, cultural aspect uh, play a role there. But the, the food product, of course, is the core of providing uh, good food from your location. It's something that we can support by, you know, uh, working from our several test kitchens. We have a test kitchen here in Holland. We have one in London. We have one in France. We have one in uh, Chicago. That's all things that we can support your operation, we can develop together with you a successful food program. I think you're uh, in your test kitchen, are, are you right now, Lawrence? Yes, yes, actually, uh, yeah, this is uh, our pride uh, test kitchen uh, here back in the Netherlands. Uh, yeah, I'm sitting in front of a big cooker hood right here. And uh, yeah, he, here's where we work with our customers. Last week we had um, A-Holt, uh, which our um, uh, uh, food-to-go program, but a couple of weeks ago, we also had 7-Eleven over here. So this is really the heart of our operation. Uh, next to that, you have to, to create uh, the right logistics, the right uh, operation inside your store. And with cereals, you can have a turnaround of a week with fresh food, maybe two or three days. But with hot food, you have to consider a successful hot food program. You have to turn around in, in two hours or let's say maximum of four hours. And we can help you support you know, getting the food to the oven, but also uh, helping to, according to HACCP uh, uh, rules, getting it from the oven into your merchandiser. Uh, we provide, obviously, equipment, uh, convection, combis, uh, but also hot counters. Uh, what's also very important uh, is, is, is choosing the right quality of your equipment, but also how does your equipment present it to the customer? So it's all about visibility, um, we're especially strong in, in creating a visible environment for your products, um, but also providing the right accessories to do so. And then last but not least, we talk about hot food. We talk about total different type of packaging. Um, we work with a lot of companies around the world that can provide this kind of packaging. And you can understand that it must re withstand the heat. Um, it must, the food must be visible. Uh, it should be dealing with condensation and all this kind of stuff that, that creates, you know, uh, the, the, the right packaging. 
Um, then uh, what do we provide? Eh? What can we provide as a company? Uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, Nick. Um, um, we, we provide hot and cold counters in all different type of formats. What's nice about the counters is that uh, you can mix and match. You, uh, hot and cold can be standing right next to each other like it does uh, in Morrison's. Uh, we have um, very good technology. Um, we work with a hot air blanket if we're dealing with uh, heated food. Um, and it's, it's um, uh, uh, connecting to the food from all, uh, from both from the bottom and the top. And that makes a huge difference if you only take it from the top or only uh, from the bottom. We can also provide open counters with the highest refrigerator or a very high refrigeration classification of 3M1. Uh, probably we're one of the few that can do that, but also the capacity of the counters is, is pretty impressive because of the technology, we have more display area and especially in, in small stores, um, that's very essential. Eh? How much food can you put in front of the customer and the more food you can put in front of the customer, the more attractive it is. Also, visibility of the food plays a huge role. Um, if we compare ourselves to others, our visible total display area is, is substantial bigger, especially on the hot food equipment, but also on the refrigerated equipment. And of course, how do you position it towards your consumer is also important. And you can do that with all kinds of range of accessories. Now, um, this is what we can provide. This is what we bring to the table. Uh, this is what we would say the how, and, and what can we create together? Uh, and if we go to the next slide, you can see is um, our equipment inside the, the Morrison Market Kitchen. Um, it's a fantastic concept. Um, uh, uh, thank you, Dan, for the very nice video you shot uh, in, in that store. But on the left, you see um, how we represent, how we present the hot food. And on the left, sorry, on the, on the left, you can see how we present the hot food. On the right, you can see uh, how we present the refrigerated food. And it's all about visibility. Visibility will sell the food. And of course, next to visibility is we try to create a counter that you can uh, fully form in the, into the look and feel that um, you would like. Just thinking about your impulse point for Generation Z, um, that uh, that that obviously pulls, you know, that 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 seems to reflect exactly what you were saying, what you were looking at around the data, uh, Lawrence, in terms of the importance of impulse uh, for for that generation. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, and, and and you can only expect that to grow, and especially when when people are getting more and more of their food outside the home, um, um, but the location is that important that they will shop you know, uh, 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 at the gas station, they will shop at the city centers, they will shop at obvious locations where C stores are, you know, are present. And if you really want to dig into that generation, um, then uh, uh, you know, they're, they're triggered by impulse. You should create, well, of course, you know, very nice concept, but also um, hot food as that's creating most of the impulse um, uh, yeah, from from shoppers, eh? that that it's it's attractive and it's something that you can eat now. Eh? It's it's food on the on, on the way. Very so sensory, yes, yeah. yeah, so very experiential sensory type um, ex uh, shopping uh, experience. Yeah, uh, another example. This is what we did for uh, the Lise de France. Also, I think this is probably a, a week old. Uh, the Lise de France in. Um, Stanford, UK, uh, based in an, uh, in a NISA uh, C store. Um, this is more geared around uh, refrigerated food, uh, but we can combine it. Eh? We we um, um, and and this is more our smaller counters. We ha also have bigger counters, which also go into C store type of operations. Like um, this is a nice concept that we're doing for uh, Maxol. Uh, I think it's a nice picture, also linking to. The, 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 the guest of uh, last week. Um, but here again, you can see it's all about visibility of the food and maintaining the quality. And um, I think we're, there we have a lot of experience and that goes really all around the world. Uh, we supply to companies like Walmart, but also here's an example of what we, um, what we did in Australia. 
And I think it's remarkable bringing a rotisserie chicken into a BP wild bean cafe, uh, which is exceptional in a petrol station uh, selling rotisserie chicken. But it's also a concept that we developed together with um, um, David Jones, which is a really, really high end uh, food uh, company uh, in Australia and also owned by Woolworth uh, from South Africa. Um, I think another example that um, uh, the diversity of all different of, uh, types of hot food or at least fresh foods, um, the customers we're dealing with all around the world. Very, very good. Yeah, no, David Jones, I think, uh, well worth watching um, uh, and, and taking a closer look at. We're hoping to do that soon. Uh, Lawrence, that was terrific. Thanks very much for, for, for joining us and, uh, you know, just sort of explaining some of of, of how you know uh, retailers like Morrison's um, got to got to you know that fabulous uh, looking store. Um, so um, yeah, uh, great uh, great to have you uh, on the program today. Um, Thank you, Dan. So see you soon. Um, let me bring in um, our our next guest, Scott Annan. If you could join us, please, Scott. So Scott, we've known each other. Hey, for... How are you doing? Yeah, good, sir. We've known each other for many years. Um, we, um, you and I, uh, haven't been able to travel as much as we have uh, in previous years in 2020. But I think, to be fair to you, you've probably done uh, more than most. Um, I know you've been out to Germany recently. You've been, you've been, um, you've, you know, you've, you've, you've stayed on the road. And um, I think, you know, you're you're also joining us on the panel, Scott. But um, I think you're going to talk to us a little bit about what you've seen on the road and you're going to pick out your number one roadside retail location globally, which I think there's a bit of interest in finding out who you've uh, who you've selected for that uh, for that. And also just talk a little bit about home delivery and, um, you know, what's uh, what's going on, um, you know, just yes, yes, the context of, 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 of some big changes. Good. Thank you, Dan. Uh, namaste, everyone. Um, Back in 2005, I led a team that launched Marks & Spencer's Simply Food at BP. The retail strategy was very, very simple. Every customer eats and drinks three times a day. So there are a thousand sales opportunities. The customer value proposition was even simpler. Um, no one starts their day thinking, I want to eat crap food. So that, that's my sort of little semi joke to, to, to start the presentation. But the big message for today, Dan, is 15 years ago, I, I started on a journey to get roadside retailers to focus on 100% of their customers' needs, eating and drinking, rather than the 18% that smoke, or indeed the 20% that buy stuff on impulse. Nick, please. So this store that I'm going to feature today is uh, Morn's Centra in Strand Road in the city of Derry, Northern Ireland. Um, this is my current number one roadside retail location of the world. Um, picking number ones is always a little controversial, but as Dan said, I've been very privileged and I've seen an awful lot of roadside retailers around the world and this is actually my number one. And uh, if John is listening, uh, he will know it's my fault for scoring them 10 out of 10. So if we could see the video, please, Nick. Fantastic. So a couple of weeks ago, uh, I visited the store with the head of a, a global fuel retailer and uh, she said, this is the best store I've ever seen and it's the best food 
roadside food I've ever eaten. So I think there was a little bit of endorsement for my 10 out of 10. So this is John and, and Donna's brand, um, Morns. It's freshly prepared daily in their own kitchen. They've got three stores which this kitchen supplies. Um, just go back one, please, Nick. These main salads are served fantastic, by the way. This, this is what we actually ate when we visited. These main salads are served in 100% recyclable card plates and plastic lids because this need has not gone away. This is still hugely important. The dishes are seasonal and these ones in particular have a one day shelf life. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Nick. Also offered are cheese and meat and vegetarian platters, which uh, they sell alongside the traditional triangle sandwiches. And as we can see here, the, the filled speciality breads. Over 90% of the fresh food is um, proprietary. It is the, uh, the Morns brand and it is uh, locally sourced Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, which is hugely important uh, for the customers in, in this particular location. Locally sourced, massively important. Fresh food for today it does also include uh, served over, which you can see here. So made to order deli, salad, sandwiches, soups, and hot dishes. And just as a little call out here, uh, this is the number one destination of the 20 independent retailer owners that sit in the UK and the Republic of Ireland forum of which John is a member uh, and, and I'm privileged to be part of. Nick. So the coffee is also proprietary uh, with their own beans, which all ties very nicely together. Uh, I showed this at a, a US conference last week and they got terribly confused when I told them that you could buy an espresso, which was one ounce in size. Uh, they couldn't really get their head round uh, our wonderful espresso rather than um, bathtubs of coffee. But John's coffee is exceptional. So Dan mentioned that um, I was going to talk a little bit about home delivery. Um, been with us for a long time, but obviously massive priority for people um, since the beginning of this year. So during lockdown, it started Jemsons of Rye is another one of the forum retailers. They've taken their 75 year heritage. You can, you can see the van here. And they set up in house and from beginning to end, they took three weeks. <clears throat> the strategy was very, very simple at the beginning of lockdown. Let's keep our customers, let's hold the revenue. And most importantly, and, and, and this is my second message of um, today is hold the data. Data is oil, it's gold, whatever you want to call it. And by going to a third party, um, there is a risk. They own the customers, they own the data. The way that Stephen has done it here is, there is no tech company disintermediation risk. Thanks, Nick. Now, a little bit of fun. Um, food delivery is not a recent innovation. Uh, this is the Mumbai uh, double waller system. This is picked up at home. So this is your homemade hot food and it is delivered to your office or your place of work. It's been going for 130 years. There are 200,000 daily deliveries and collections. These packages are taken back home for you. And the error rate is one in a million. It's not low tech, it's no tech. This picture was taken last year with the Retail Leaders Forum, where we actually got to ride the train into Mumbai with the double wallers. So um, we think everything is new, but it's not. All we're doing is recycling ideas. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Now, th this is my third message, really, of, um, of, of my wee session here. 
Germany is Europe's number one retail market. Um, in my opinion, roadside retail has not evolved in the last 20 years. And my backup for that is over 60% of sales are still in fully visible tobacco. So roadside retail is, is basically the tobacconist of Germany. There are 47 or thousand of these wonderful things. These are uh, Baccarat bakers, and they have stepped up. So they are now providing cafes, Wi-Fi, great food, minimal neighborhood grocery. They'll never ever call themselves convenience stores, but as Dan said, a couple of weeks ago, I was in Germany. They are damn convenient. So for German consumers, these are the convenient stores, not roadside retail. And, and my message is there is a very big learning for us here if we just choose to rely on smokes and cokes and we don't actually evolve and mature our offer. Nick, thank you. So my third, third little message to wrap it all up, and, and, and Dan showed the excellent video in Morrison's Manchester. Uh, Dan and I are physically going to see that store next week. Um, this is my friend, Chris Tanko. Many of you will know Chris. I, I met Chris in Japan nearly 10 years ago. As 7-Eleven USA Chief Operating Officer, Chris has visited daily franchise and company owned stores all throughout the United States. Personal view, uh, if you're a retail leader, we should be out in shops supporting our shop team. We should be talking to customers. It's 100% legal. And sometimes it just takes a little bit of corporate courage, but I, I think we need to be out in shops. Closing message, get out there. World's a small place. See what's going on with your customers, home and abroad, and always, 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 as we did in John and Donna Morn's store in Derry, try the local homemade food. Thank you, Dan. Namaste. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Um, well, Scott, you stay with us, and I'd like to, I'd like to invite Noel Keeley um, and Gavin Rothwell. Uh, onto onto our panel. Um, hello, Noel. How are you doing? Um, obviously, Noel um, is Group CEO at Musgrave, um, and Scott uh, will have a few opinions on these on these these things. Uh, how are you doing, Noel? Well, I'm absolutely thrilled. Um, I just saw one of our very valued customers and a very good friend of mine win a global accolade. That's um, that's something that's not something that e that's easily done. So. And I can tell you a very well-deserved accolade. It's a fantastic store. So uh, my many, many, many congratulations to, to John and Donna. I'm overview a visit to Derry, unfortunately, like everybody else. We're, uh, we're locked in at the moment, but I shall very much look forward to going up to celebrate that. Well done, John. Yeah, well done, well done to, to Morn Centre, and it looks fabulous. Um, looks absolutely fabulous. Um, I, I, we had another message while you were talking in from... Um, from 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 uh, BP, who 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 perhaps visited with with you, Scott. I don't know, but uh, fantastic product quality and really passionate team. Well done, John, Donna, and team. So um, a lot of people are very impressed. I think it's fair to say about Morn Centra. So well done, guys. Gavin, um, warm welcome to you. Um, Thank you, Dan. You've got uh, you, you're very uh, you've got a lot of uh, interesting things to say on what's going on in. Uh, in, in UK and Irish food retail, and it's a pleasure to, to be able to have you on the, on the programme. Thank you for um, the opportunity. Very, very welcome. So let's get into it, guys. Um, perhaps, Noel, I could start with you and then we, I, can, I can move to, to questions for Scott and, and Gavin. Um, so, if, Noel, first, um, let's just obviously, let's think about the impact of, of COVID on shopping patterns and trends in food retail. I mean, would you like to, to comment on that initially? Absolutely. Uh, I suppose for those of you who don't know me, I was, I've was i been working with Musgrave for 15 years, but I was appointed the group CEO in January 1st of this year. Um, and when you go into a role like that, you feel obliged to write a 100-day plan. And I can honestly say that nowhere in that plan did the words global pandemic feature. Um, so it was pretty easy to bin that um, and begin to 
look at really what was an extraordinary set of events. Um, and obviously, initially, what we saw was panic buying, um, a, a, a scared and perhaps nervous consumer about the supply chain and the availability of food. And of course, the real irony there being that the more they panic bought, the more the supply chain came under pressure. There was lots of food if people didn't panic buy, but we did see uh, a key challenge in that period. We also saw a significant change in mix early on. So people moving into more stable type products were, um, you know, baking, pasta, tin foods, things that obviously had a good life on them, but also, you know, there were staples that they, they knew they could uh, store at home. And then we also saw a significant uh, switch in terms of the number of people coming into the store. So the actual number of transactions beginning to fall substantially, but the, the transaction size going up significantly. Um, and then probably the, the last big feature would, would have been on the grocery side in our supermarket business where we saw a 400% increase in, in demand for online. And, and how has it impacted your business just staying on, uh, staying on Musgrave uh, and looking across all the formats that, uh, that of course, you, you, you operate? Yeah, well, well, as you probably are aware, Musgrave is a, is a food business and, and our, our stated ambition um, is to be a world-class food and beverage business that delivers market-leading customer experiences every day. Um, and we're in the end-to-end -end food market in the belief that it's not about share of basket anymore, it's about share of consumption or share of stomach, if you want to use a more crude term. Um, and what we saw is on the convenience side of the car, in terms of high convenience, city centre locations and forecourts, they suffered um, simply because people didn't go to work and many of them uh, depend on that lunchtime trade and so on. And then obviously when people weren't commuting, uh, the forecourt side of it suffered as well. Um, where we had convenience stores that had a broader range where they were able to serve that big basket shop, they actually benefited uh, because I think people were surprised when they went into those stores what they could actually get and that there was a better range than perhaps what they might have anticipated. Our supermarkets did very well. Um, and I'm pleased to say that for the last seven months, Super Value is the number one player in the market uh, in the south of Ireland. Um, and we believe that happened because we, were, we, we reacted very quickly to... The, the first thing we did was we said, we've got to look after the safety of our teams and the safety of consumers. Uh, because ultimately our ambition was to keep the supply chain safe and clean. Um, so we immediately moved to put in the right levels of precautions within our own staff, but also in store. And we introduced things like plexiglass and social distancing before we were mandated to do that uh, by the government. Um, and that we have continued to trade well uh, on, on the back of that. And then our hospitality or our delivered food service business fell off a cliff. It, it was quite frightening, actually. Uh, it was literally like somebody just turned it off overnight um, with some of our businesses. If you look at Lou's Foods, which is a, a high end um, food service business focusing in on kind of, let's call um, white tablecloth restaurants, five star hotels, dropping 95 percent in sales uh, overnight. Mm -hmm. So uh, very much a mixed bag. Very much a mixed picture. Um so we, we've heard about just thinking about the program so far, Gavin. I mean, we've heard about uh, obviously we many of us saw the, the the great Morrison store. Then we heard Lawrence talking about the importance of food to go um, long term uh, for, for 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 the industry, and 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 actually it's something we've been doing pretty well in as, as for the convenience store side of uh, of, of trade. Um, can I ask you to look over the longer term and uh, and beyond COVID? You know talk a little bit about what food changes and trends that you anticipate. Sure. And, um, and I think kind of the key thing is, you know, as we look beyond the current COVID crisis, then, then actually there are some, still some great opportunities for food to go out there. So I very much look at that cross section between retail and food to go. And you can see around the world, a number of new initiatives continuing to come through. I think the Morrison's Market Kitchen is a really good one. And I've no doubt, Dan, that you'll really enjoy your, uh, your visit there next week. Um, but Morrison's are already planning to do more of the, that type of execution. I think there are four supermarkets on the way where they're looking to adapt it, but apply a similar kind of execution into those supermarket concepts. And that'll be fascinating to see how that develops. 
Um, clearly, I think one of the great things that Morrison's has done there, sorry, you've got me on Morrison's now, is, is really bringing out some of their core strengths in terms of that food maker positioning, but yet adapting that to be, to be more of that food for now mission, whereas traditionally it is going to be more focused on that food for later, on the fuller weekly shop. And I think that type of thinking in terms of what are my key strengths as a retailer now? How can I adapt those to be relevant in that food to go space is going to become more important for more businesses going forward. And I think on that food to go side, I think, yep, clearly, as Noel was saying, in city center locations, it, it's really tough right now. The flip side of that is that in, should we say, more neighborhood catchments, suddenly there's a bigger market opportunity. So suddenly we're seeing kind of retailers with a potential market that's swollen quite a lot through people working at home. And, and actually, they don't all want to make lunch at home every day. So if you get the proposition right, if you make it easier for that customer base to access your, your products and services, then there are opportunities out there to grow that side of the business. We've all been watching a really nice video that uh, you, your team put out on uh, on that new super value store at uh, Westport, I think it is, um, Noel. And uh, Gavin, any comments on on on, on all, the, all the all the all the all the sort of exciting things they're doing in that store, and just in light of what you just said? Yeah, and we had a brief discussion about this earlier on, Dan. Um, it's it, it's a great store. I think that the video is is really excellent. So if you haven't seen it already, I'd, I'd really recommend it. Um, and I think it's, it's just the, the natural evolution of some of the great work that, that Super Value and Centra have been doing in their stores over, over the past few years. Um, I think as we look into the longer term as well, I think some of that work around proposition development in the, in the convenience and food to go space. So whether that's around Frank and Honest Coffee, the Caramico Pizza, or the host of other brands that are, kind of, or sub-brands that are coming through in, in Centro and Super Value Concepts, I think that's a really interesting model to watch. And it's one that a lot of businesses could learn from as they think about what does that future opportunity look like for me and my food to go. I suppose a lot of these, uh, very, very good points. I suppose a lot of these um you know, strategies that, that you've evolved, Noel, are very, have been long, long time in the making. And you, it, it's over many years, isn't it? It's, this, this was, was not, a, this wasn't a sudden, a sudden switch. It's something you've been building and building and building, isn't it? Yeah. And, and I, I think it's a learning, Dan, that we took from being in both the food service and the food retail uh, business that what has happened over the last number of years is that those markets have blurred, um, and the reality of it is the, our particularly centralized an example is as much a food service outlet now as it is a convenience store. Um, and if I look at it, it, it's also what the, what the, what the consumer wants. Um, they want choice and um, they want to be able to go in and get what they want when they want it. Uh, and uh, indeed at a price they're willing to pay. So, so retail, I suppose, will never change because that's the fundamental rule. Um, but if we look at, you know, for example, frank and honest, being able to give the consumer a quality cup of coffee at a very, very good price, uh, and that has become the number one selling coffee now on the island of Ireland, which is a, a remarkable achievement from something that we've only rolled out four years ago, Caramico Pizza now, which is in also enjoying significant success. Uh, and you'll see some of those concepts in that video. And uh, we we will launch a new generation super value store, although you saw a lot of it in that video, but a, a, a brand new new generation super value store will launch in Knockline in Dublin in the spring. Uh, and that will include concessions of businesses that we have bought either completely uh, or the licenses of. So Donnybrook Fair, you will, will manifest inside that store as a store within a store as will the happy pear, uh, which as you're probably aware is a vegetarian vegan proposition and uh, has been incredibly successful and to which we own the exclusive rights on the island of Ireland. Oh, looking forward to, to visiting that store. Um, that sound, sounds terrific. Scott, you wouldn't disagree with any of these points, presumably in terms of the direction of travel um, for the industry. Oh no, not, not at all. F fully support what um, Noel and Gavin are saying. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to the semi-jokey point I, I made at the beginning that, you know, we all eat and drink three times a day, thousand sales opportunities. The Amazon approach is if you've got $100 to spend, they want $100. Um, 
our approach could be we 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 want all the uh, we we want all the meal times and then you know no saying you know blurring etc well I, I i think when we look at how you know governments have have handled this and 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 as we come out of it sec- sectors have have now all come together it's it's really about customer needs and those people, whether it's Noel on a national scale or, or, or John in, in his three stores, if we remember that, you know, we, 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 we need to be excited, things need to be interesting, um, good quality. So all, all of that is available. And, you know, I, I feel there's quite a lot of our retailers are, are a little slow in getting there. And, you know, there is that opportunity to change and be aware of what we are now looking for. Once the, the whole flotsam of, you know, COVID-19 hopefully disappears and, and, and governments get their heads back on again, then it's business as normal. But it's not going to be normal from February. It's, it's the new normal and stores like the ones that um, Gavin's talked about, Knowles opened to, to me, that is the future. Uh, it sure is hell ain't roadside retailing. You know, let's sell an impulse Snickers bar and, um, you know, tobacco. Uh, it's not really what it's about now. It's about needs, food, looking after the customer. Yeah, I think just to build on, the, on that point, Dan, the, the, you know, we talk about giving customers solutions and taking away pain points for them now. And I think that's what, that's what, I think that's what consumers want. And I often use this example in, in the business when we're talking strategy uh, is that I'm sure you've used Uber or, or my taxi or free now with the equivalent that, you know, took what is arguably a huge amount of pain out of what was an everyday task. And that was calling a taxi, you know, and if, particularly if you lived in rural Ireland and you, you wanted to get a taxi or John, I'm sure will tell you if you want to get a taxi in Derry. We've lost that. We've lost now um, temporarily, hopefully. Um, but um, let me, let me bring up another topic while, um, while Noel, Noel comes back again. And I was going to raise sustainability. Um, now, um, how many retail businesses, uh, and perhaps Gavin, you could take this first. How many retail businesses have been um, have have had their sustainability agenda um, knocked um, off track by um, by COVID? I, I, th- I think most have done, Dan, and uh, I think it's there's very much been a kind of response in terms of we need to be adaptable now. We need to if you like, firm up our business and we'll do what it takes to meet our customers' needs right now. But that said, I think that longer term, the longer term perspective is that it's absolutely paramount to keep that sustainability roadmap in mind. So this is a a diversion, if you like, a deviation along the way. But many of those, well, all of those core principles that businesses will have set out in that strategy before, they're still very much relevant, still very much intact. And in fact, even now we're seeing some important new initiatives coming through. You and I, Dan, were talking offline about the Brewdog Initiative and how they're yeah. looking to become better or come positive in terms of their input. And we've seen some initiatives from the likes of Chipotle and Panera in the US in terms of how they're looking to outline what the carbon footprint of different dishes is. That's something that's coming. Um, so it's really interesting to see how they're pushing that along the way and making it more of a factor in what they do and how they do it. No, we were just, uh, we were just, uh, Gavin and I were just talking about the sustainability agenda and how many, how COVID, if COVID has pushed certain retailers off, off track for their sustainability agenda. What would you say on that from a, from a Musgrove perspective? My immediate reaction is we can't allow that to happen. Uh, I, I think it's one of those things that, uh, you know, it's like in any crisis, things that had an importance, but that can wait when we get set aside. Um, but I don't think we can afford to do that. And uh, certainly it was something that we're very conscious of. We've just recently launched compostable packaging for uh, organic fruit and veg. Um, and we see that as significant. And, you know, when when Scott talks about um, uh, Generation uh, Z coming up, uh, you, you know, the, the, the reality of it is, is that these, what they call the, so, the, the say-do gap is much, it's much narrower. 
if I take my own kids, you know, they, they all have go mugs. And when they see me with it, with it even though it's a compostable cup, they're, they can't understand why I would use that when, when you can have a, a permanent cup. So I think the consumer of the future will vote with their feet if you don't respond to that agenda. It's quite simple. Makes makes sense. Um, let me throw in for just thinking about the UK for a minute and some of some quite a few big developments happened recently. Um, so perhaps I could address this one to Scott first and then Gavin. So um, obviously, if we think about um, the, you know, the the EG or rather the Issa brothers um, acquisition of um, of uh, of Asda, um, if we think about Sainsbury's and Simply Fresh, that tie up, um, you know, there's been some um, some pretty big um, Pretty big development. So, and, and the other thing I should mention is the Sainsbury's decision on deli counters. So, I mean, those three things, uh, Gavin and Scott. Um, I don't know if you have any views. Could join the dots. See, 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 see something bigger behind behind that. Um, maybe Scott could take that one first. It's a bit of a tough question, but you like those seventeen questions? I think Dan. Actually, <laughs> I, I'll, I'll probably leave sixteen of them to Gavin. So, <laughs> Fair enough. Um, thank you, Scott. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. So I, I, again, I was privileged. I, I was in uh, Euro Garages Cumberland Farms headquarters back in March. If you look at their US operation, uh, it's very different from their excellent European operation where, you know, they have Lego bricks of different brands coming in. In the USA, you've got you've got Cumberland Farms and you've, you've got the other ones. So it was a, a different business model that they could understand. So if you look at ASDA, um, they, they were already trialing, uh, I will call them little ASDAs in, in their sites. Uh, I think if one follows it logically and, and you look at their USA experience of basically owning a brand and running with it yourself, um, I would anticipate seeing uh, a lot more little ASDAs in, in perhaps some of their excellent sites. There's, there's one adjacent to where my, my daughter lives, which I visit weekly and I, I could just see this, you know, working perfectly. So um, that's one of the big changes. Um, these things have evolved for, for many, many years, but that I would see that being um, a major change. Forecast opinion, but, but that, that's what I would see it. So, um, Gavin, you've got the other 26 questions. Thank you, Scott. And then just to pick up on the, the EG ASDA point, or rather the ESA brothers and, and ASDA, I think it'll be really interesting to see how they, they take some of the maybe existing Lego bricks and maybe a few new ones and put those into ASDA stores, because that could, could reshape what ASDA delivers for, for its customers and, and make it quite a different concept versus what it has been over the past couple of years. Um, I think more broadly, there are some really interesting things going on in, in the convenience sector in the UK right now. We saw the nicer store earlier that, um, that the guys were talking around. That's it's, it's worth a visit if you can see that one, Dan. Um, but I think more broadly, yeah, the Simply Fresh point is an interesting one. And in that nicer store, how the co-op supply deal is is changing the face of, to be honest, what, what nicer stand for. That's an interesting one to watch as well. So lots of, lots of opportunity, lots of exciting things going on there. And I think that differentiation for, for anyone in that convenience sector just becomes more important than ever going forward. Um, everyone, so you talked about Lego bricks, but I, I'd say it's train sets. I mean, you know, there's certainly EG Group and uh, Issa Brothers have certainly got a pretty exciting train set to work with. And they they always seem to be able to bring innovation to, to, you know, to, I don't know whether I'm extending the metaphor too far to their train sets, don't they, when they, when they use them. And, um, you know, they, 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 they always, not to be underestimated uh, in terms of, of, of how they, how they will, will, um, will figure this out, I'd say. Absolutely. And I think there's, there's quite a lot going on around pizza right now um, mm. in four courts. And it's, it's not just um, EG experimenting with it it's others looking at that as well so I think how that evolves going forward could be quite an interesting one. I've got to bring you in on pizza Noel because um, I, a couple of, I think it was a couple of years ago I first saw your Caramico pizza and the interesting thing when I talked to the store owner in the centre was that um, they said you know we're not in a in a in a big city and yet um, our pizza's working really well because you know it's it's the best offer in town and it's a very good offer and it's you do it incredibly well. Um, you must be pleased that that's, if that's working well, because it's something that uh, a lot of people have been trying to get going for a while. And I'd say you, you know, you've nailed it, haven't you? 
Um, we're nailing it, is what I would say, Dan. Um, mm-hmm. We ha- it, First of all, the, the, quali- the, the quality of the product is superb. Um, and, you know, I, if you've had the opportunity to taste the product, I think it really is a very different proposition than, let's call it, the mainstream pizza market. Um, the reality of pizza in the market is that 70% of pizza sales take place between 6 o'clock in the evening and 10 o'clock at night, and 70% of that is delivered. So to get after the, the market, you've got to be able to have a proposition in that space. But we're very pleased with Caramico. Well, we're now out on 12 sites. It's working very well for us. Um, and as we develop these brands, Caramico, Happy Pear, Donnybrook Fair, we're also looking at the opportunity to internationalize those concepts and potentially license them into other operators. Because the reality of it is we've done all the legwork in terms of product quality and and so on and the and the commercial models um, and we believe that you know there are supermarkets and convenience stores all over the world that could take caramico pizza or that could take um, frank and Donald's coffee it has to be a big opportunity i mean you've create you've spent a lot of time creating those brands haven't you and you yeah. know they're 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 they're, they're you know, they're, they're valuable, um, uh, valuable propositions. Well, um, we've reached, uh, unfortunately, I have to say, because I think we could carry on for, for a while, but we, we've reached the end of our 15 minutes. So it just, uh, it just, it's just down to me to, to thank um, you, Gavin, for joining us, Scott and, uh, and Noel. Thank you very much for uh, joining us on Shop Talk. And, um, you know, I think we've had a, a pretty interesting conversation. So um, really pleased that you could spend the time, guys. Thank Thanks you. very much, and sorry for the connectivity problems, Dan. Thank you. Not at all. Not at all. Um, well, thank, thanks, guys. Um, just before we, we close, um, uh, obviously, uh, interesting discussions today, but wanted to give you a sense of, of what's coming up. Um, we've got a week off next week, and, um, but we've got something, I think, quite interesting and, and, and special coming up on the 20th of November. Um, one of the big focuses of that session will be a Matthew Brennan. Now, Matthew Brennan is is very well known speaker and writer focusing on the Chinese mobile technology and innovation uh, space. Uh, he's very well known, uh, regularly appears on the BBC, uh, in, in the FT, is reported in the FT, The Economist, uh, Bloomberg. Um, so very, very well known uh, guy in this space. And um, He's, uh, he's just ri- uh, written a very interesting book, uh, which I read last weekend called Attention Factory, which is telling the story of TikTok and the company behind it, which is, which is ByteDance. Um, incredible sort of inside of view of, of what's happening in China right now. And of course, in China, the, uh, the economy is doing rather well uh, for, for 2020. And all the innovation, the retail innovation that... Uh, that many of us who, who've been over there in the last couple of years, myself on, a, on, on the Nax Convenience Summit Asia uh, event in Shanghai. And, and I just realized that it was a place we needed to learn from in a, from a retail technology point of view. So it's gonna be really interesting um, to, to, to have uh, Matthew on the program and Scott, you'll be coming back on that one as well. It's a market, you, it's an area of the world that you know extremely well and we'll be looking at uh, at some of the we're we'll looking at attention factory talking to matthew but also thinking about what's coming our way uh, from a retail tech point of view on the 20th of november so look forward to that and um until then um thanks for watching and um see you soon thank you <laughs>